I'm aware some of you won't have been here last night and say, if, if you weren't, my name is Paul. I'm part of the Coors team based up at Causeway Case Vineyard. Uh, and this is Paul and Steph Lay, who lead Manchester Vineyard. Uh, and also, yes, there's a bit of love for that. I'm surprised it didn't come from these three <laughs> who came over from Manchester with Paul and Steph. Uh, but Paul and Steph lead Manchester Vineyard uh, and they also, uh, they also oversee all of the cause to live for. And so we just wanted to, um, to just to spend a little bit of time having a conversation, uh, mining them for some of their wisdom, hearing some of their story uh, just before we break for lunch. I, I will say very quickly, we will wrap this up by half past 12 so that we'll be able to go and get some lunch. I know some of you will be sitting there going, my tummy is rumbling, would they shut up? Uh, and so we will we'll wrap it by about then. Um, I just, I guess I wanted to start by asking you, Paul and Steph, I'm aware that for, for some of us in the room, some of what we've experienced over the last 24 hours will be really quite normal, we'll be very used to it. But for others of us, others of us in the room, maybe uh, some of the encounters of the Holy Spirit that we've experienced, uh, it might be the first time we've had that. Uh, and, and maybe seeing some of the way that God poured out his presence last night again might be a little bit new for us and so uh, I, I know there's power sometimes when, when we hear people's story and then we can hear ourselves in uh, in their stories and so I guess we'd just love you guys to share a little bit of how did you first come into encountering the Holy Spirit what was that like and, and how has that developed for you guys maybe over the years let's start there shall I start okay so I'll start because I encountered the vineyard uh, much earlier than Paul. Um, so I can't really remember life before being part of the vineyard church. Um, my family found the vineyard when I was maybe seven or eight. Um, and so I've been sort of immersed in, in vineyard and, and how we do uh, ministry and how we encounter the Holy Spirit right from the earliest days. So for me, it's sort of been just the fabric of my life, really. And um, my mom and dad loving Jesus, praying in tongues in the, in the home, um, being open to moves of the Spirit was always, um, yeah, commonplace for me. Um, so I think probably you'll have more more of a story of, of, of not knowing and experiencing what it is to, to sort of live and be raised in a context of the Holy Spirit. Um, so you can probably speak into that more, can't you? But um, I just want to say that it's been an enormous privilege. And so um, for any of you who will go on to raise sons and daughters, your own physical sons and daughters or others, spiritual sons and daughters, exposing them to the Holy Spirit, to the power of who he is, to his presence, becoming just comfortable with, with who he is and how he moves in unexpected and mysterious and beautiful ways um, can only be a, a really good thing. Um, I'm hugely grateful for the, the heritage that I have and um, my parents' pursuit of the Holy Spirit. Actually, they when they when they met each other, they neither of them had a faith. And about six months before they got married, they had a profound encounter with the Holy Spirit, which they now look back on and can say it's the Holy Spirit, um, which anyway triggered them uh, in a response in them to, to to work out what on earth that was. Found a church, ended up finding Jesus, being baptized pretty much overnight, and giving their lives to to to, to God. Um, and then we're on a kind of a pursuit of finding the Holy Spirit. And so that's, yeah, and they've never departed from, from that. So, yeah, do you want to add? Yeah, I um, grew up in a church that really didn't believe in the Holy Spirit. Um, and I didn't really realize that until later on in life. But there, there was this dear lady, she used to be about six rows from, uh, from the front on a Sunday, and she'd stick an arm out like this and everyone would look at her. Uh, and that's, that's kind of, that we were quite conservative, so one arm out, one person was like a significant problem. Um, so I bumbled through life till about 19 and went to play football in Manchester, didn't know that I was going to this thing where a load of people were worshiping Jesus. And I encountered the Holy Spirit in a way that changed my life forever. Um, and Steph introduced me, well actually we met each other the next day um, God did me 
good one there. Um, uh, many, I well, then went along, Steph took me along to the vineyard and I walked in and I was like, what is this thing? Um, I'd never been in anything like it. Uh, and found I was a real mess. Like my childhood was very complicated and I was a very, very broken person. And I just, my, my only thing really is I wish somebody had told me sooner uh, that there was a way to find healing and wholeness and life. Um, and it changed my life. But I think the thing that was fundamental to that was worshiping Jesus. I've, I've had counseling and cognitive behavioral therapy and I've met with small groups of guys who've prayed for me over many years and I'm all for it and it's wonderful. But if I was to say single-handedly the thing that has changed my life, it's been environments where I've worshiped Jesus and I've took my attention from myself and I've put it onto him. And, um, and then at every single opportunity and every single moment responding to the Holy Spirit and asking people to pray for me. And I, I just give you a, almost a picture of my desperation is uh, every Sunday, I didn't even know what really happened, but this guy in a rugby shirt would speak and at the end he'd say he wants to respond to the Holy Spirit. And I'd, I'd respond. And l literally every week, I reckon I cried every week for years and years and years and years. Um, and I'd do it everywhere, small groups, wherever it was. I was like, can we do that thing that you're doing? Because this is the change of my life. <laughs> and um, there was one Sunday where he said, there's a, there's a lady in this room who's struggling to conceive and um, nobody responded that Sunday and it was just me. And uh, <laughs> I, I obviously just, I needed to know this. I know you know this, but I wasn't responding to that word. But I was like, I just, I just want, I want the Lord. And I'd found a way to engage with him and interact with him. And I, ever since, it's been a joy to keep having that myself, but also to help other people realize, well, I guess my only thing really is, I just wish somebody had told me sooner that you can have a real living relationship with God through the power of his Holy Spirit. And it's, it's yeah, it's everything. Yeah, and just to add to that, I think one of the wonderful, one of the many wonderful things about the vineyard is our is our, our theology, our kingdom theology, and our understanding that God is one in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And so um, we, yeah, it's just pertinent that we embrace all three um, and we just a little little story um, about our youngest daughter she I don't know why or where it really came from but she's basically just absolutely obsessed with the Trinity <laughs> just, every every answer for everything is the Trinity isn't it it's just so great so this is probably like when she was so back when she was about five a couple of years ago I could hear her cutting rustling in her room lots of shuffling of paper and things. And I went in and she'd, she'd drawn three circles and cut out three circles and she'd written um, God, Jesus and Holy Spirit on, on each of them. And she was like, look, if I put them on top of each other, it's one. And then it's three. And it's one. It's three. It's one. <laughs> anyway, she, um, yes, her heart's been captured for um, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. And um, she, even from the earliest days, has been... I think just pressing in to understand what that means, what it means to have a God who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and the the, the personhood of each member of the of the Trinity, and so uh, yeah, just an encouragement to absolutely embrace three persons um, of the one very good God that that we worship. Yeah, if you say, I love you, Jesus, she's like, yeah, and God and Holy Spirit as well. I like, almost can't say anything without, anyway. Yeah. Adding in the whole, yeah. makes the preachers longer. Yeah, it makes every conversation longer. Yeah. Um, um, I want to pick up on something you were sharing about there, which was uh, just the brokenness with which you came before the Lord. And, you know, our heritage as a, as a vineyard move is just a bunch of broken people burnt out, coming before Jesus, singing simple love songs to him, being captivated by him and, and having their lives changed. Uh, and, and I guess in an age where f for many of us in our 20s and 30s, we, there's a desire to seek authenticity, which is, you know, I, I love that. And, and actually part of that is us being honest about the fact that, that we are broken and that, that we need Jesus. Um, what would you speak in, I guess, to, to us in that sense of how do we come in our brokenness but also so like serve in our brokenness but kind of hold that tension of doing things wisely 
what does it look like to have the Lord meet us in our brokenness? Just speak into that. Yeah, I've I've always loved to bit about the vineyard because they just love me and they didn't ever ask me to leave. And I've been in church environments where they really didn't want me to be there um, and did ask me to leave. I was so broken. My dad was an alcoholic. He was quite abusive. My parents split when I was two, as I said last night. And I lived out the pain of that in every environment that I went into. I was really quite challenging in my school environment and probably in the, in the church environment. I remember I used to have, there was um, in Sunday school, they called it then, there was five of us in the group and there was three leaders. I had to sit on one person's knee while one person held me either side because I was, I was just troubled, um, deeply troubled. And the older I got, the more that came out. Like my prayers when I was little was, was dear Lord Jesus, please make my dad come back and live with us until I realized I didn't want him to live with us. And then my whole world fell apart and my faith fell apart because it was based on a prayer and a deal rather than on a savior. And um, then later in life, I found the savior and it kind of changed everything. And I started to be healed up and to, to realize that I could be different, but actually part of that journey is realizing you're broken and I'm still broken. I'm really broken. I'm a leader now with a limp, and I'm very, that's, that's out. A church could tell you that. You don't need to go very far. Steph could tell you that. But I, I think it's the realization that I'm not who I was, but I'm still not who I'm meant to be. I'm still on this journey, and I'm pressing in for everything within me to deal with my stuff and to own my stuff and to realize, like, I, I still find Christmas really hard. Like, some environments kind of bring me into this little child place where some of my brokenness spills out but actually owning that and trying to deal with that and trying to have people close to me speak into that to be the the holiest person that I could be and who he's ultimately created me to be because hurt people hurt people and free people free people and unless we transform our pain we transmit our pain and so we've got to do something about it we've got to we've got to deal with it I, I owe it to you that I deal with my pain but I owe it to Jesus that I deal with my pain and I've, I've had the incredible privilege of having some people that haven't left me in that you know like Steph wasn't in my hurt but she was in my healing but she wasn't my healing she pointed me to Jesus and I think you need people around you who love you and believe in you and for you and can kind of dig in for the gold that is there but some of that I would say is actually owning it ourselves saying do you know I'm, I'm, I've got some stuff that needs to come before Jesus I'm not going to settle for who I am and where I am I'm going to try and do something about it I think that's so good to, to pick up on a couple of things you just you said there one was just towards the end that Steph was with you in your healing but wasn't your healing and I think actually that's so key that it's really easy for us to look to other people to be our healing and God uses community and he uses the relationships around us but it's, it's only ever Jesus. And, uh, and especially in, in the context of romantic relationships for, for people who are coming out of hurt and pain, they, they can be a source of healing, but actually it's really important that, yeah. that to love each other well is to point each other to Jesus. So that's so key. Steph, did you want to jump in there? Yeah, I was just about to add that. Um, so whilst Paul and I had very, very different upbringings, um, that, that didn't mean, well, you know, I had a wonderful home life and um, a family, parents who loved each other uh, still do, it's glorious. Um, that didn't mean that life wasn't painful for me also. And so um, whilst home was my refuge, um, school was awful. Um, I was pretty badly bullied um, through much of my school life. And that had a profound effect on, on me. Um, and so when we arrived in Manchester in 2000 at this um, festival, Paul was 19, I was 16, we both came fairly broken in different ways and we both encountered the power of God in an extraordinary way. I would say I've never known a, a day in my life where I've not acknowledged God and, and known um, and believed in him and his presence, but it was in Manchester that I experienced the had an encounter with the Holy Spirit that was so different and so profound that it changed everything. Um, it was a kind of, a, we made a choice, I think, in that moment to be like, I'm all in. 
Um, no compromise, no looking back, no messing about. I'm in, I'm all in for this kingdom life and following Jesus. And I think it was in that, in that moment, what came off the back of that was um, a real refining process. But we had to make a choice. We had to make a choice to say yes to the refining because refining's, I mean, it's painful, isn't it? Being in a furnace, it's not going to be... It's not going to be a walk in the park. It's going to be painful. It's going to be burning stuff off us. It's going to be changing us and forming us. And um, so we had to kind of agree to that process and keep saying yes to that process. Um, and But it's so worth it. Painful, yes, but so worth it. And um, God's so kind in how he, you know, he will bring a good work to completion. What he starts, he will, he will complete. And I think there was like a promise from him in that moment of, I, I want to make you, I want to make you into a new creation. I want to make you look more like me. Are you in? And I think we both made the decision, I'm in. Um, and that's not been easy. Um, we've had to keep choosing it, but it's, it's extraordinary how he can take such brokenness and bring such beauty from it. Um, and that's, yeah, that's his handiwork. Um, and we're so grateful for that, aren't we? Um, yeah, for how he's been at work in our lives and how he continues to be. Um, but we've, got to, we've just got to keep choosing in. Um, and also standing on the fundamentals. So that, you know, our emotion, we cannot trust, we cannot always trust our emotions. Um, our feelings will lead us in, a whole array of directions and, and cause us to, to, to feel or, or think about ourselves, a whole range of things that may not be true. We've got to learn to stand on the fundamentals of, of God's promises and, and learn them and rehearse them and speak them over ourselves even when we, don't, we can't see it or we don't necessarily believe it. Just keep standing on the fundamentals of God's goodness and his promises for us um, because those are the things that will anchor us in the, in the storms. That's so good. We will, um, I, I want to pick up on that in a moment, but before we get there, I think I just want to say to the room, hopefully what you hear in, in Paul and Steph's story is the redeeming work of God. And I know that there'll be many of us in the room who as they share different parts of their story, go, oh, that's, I, I hear myself in that. Maybe it's Steph's experience at school or Paul's experience in family, or maybe it's a different... Uh, kind of brokenness that you're coming into the room this weekend in. and and I, I hope what you're hearing from it is that the the Lord can redeem it he can bring healing and he can still use you uh, and I think within that you know as you guys are sharing about your daughters and uh, you know I love your kids and spend some time with them they are they are just amazing and, and when I, I'm around them and I've got two young kids myself, like my hope is that they grow up knowing and loving Jesus and knowing the Holy Spirit from a young age. But when we hear that and we haven't had that, it's really easy to discount ourselves and just go, oh, okay, well, you know, like, I didn't have parents who loved Jesus. I didn't have parents who encountered the Holy Spirit and showed me about it. The, the Lord can still redeem it and that doesn't have to be what you pass on to your kids if the Lord brings you children. Uh, and see it's that redeeming work. You I was, yeah, I was just going to say, I remember, you know, you often, in a small group, they do those little icebreaker things where I always find them a bit awkward. <laughs> but um, I remember we were sat in once and the guys leading it said, they, everyone had to go around and say, are you more like your mum or more like your dad? And I was at the end of the line and I was just increasingly becoming more pained and more challenged. And it got to me and I just burst into tears. And... Praise God, the guy leading the group said, it's because it's you're not becoming more like your, your mum and dad, you're becoming more like Jesus. And it gave me that way out. And I think I'd always fight for people. I still find so many, like Steph's mum and dad are a, a mother and father to me, but they're not my mum and dad. My mum and dad are my mum and dad. Actually, my dad's died now, but there's just, there's brokenness, but I can, I can see that and I can acknowledge that and I can live through that. But ultimately, I'm becoming more like Jesus. I break a generational line and I step into the story of God. And I think that's an incredibly important thing. Yeah, that's so good. Um, you guys have, have talked about the choice that you've made. And Steph, you're talking about like, leaning in. Uh, and I know your, your story, and, and Paul, you shared some of it last night. 
there has been real costly obedience in following Jesus. Uh, and so we'd love for you guys to touch on that because it's easy in the kind of generation of highlight reels and just seeing snapshots of celebrity Christians looking like they're kind of doing all this fun, amazing stuff and kind of like, oh, that's, that's what I want. And but actually really to see kingdom fruit and to see the power of God break out takes costly sacrifice. So we'd love for you guys just what has stepping into the call that God has given you look like for you guys what has that obedience looked like and what would you say to the room as they step into what god has for them yeah i i shared briefly last night i was in the fire service and loved it with everything within me um steph we we got to the point where we kind of sensed the lord was calling us something else steph finished uni and did a internship with a local vineyard that we're part of she kind of felt the lord led us to do that i i have to be honest i just did it because she was doing it um one of the best things i ever did and she'd say she's been leading me ever since but um it, it was quite a profound thing to do we immersed ourselves in some of our earliest formative years in the church we got married part way through that year again just having people pour into you whilst you're pouring in we learned just to love and to serve jesus but at the end of that time we were involved in the youth work and it had grown a bit and we kind of felt the lord nudging us you have to listen to the whispers and listen to those that are around you your leaders and sometimes the prophetic but we felt the lord nudging me to leave the fire service and steph was working in a marketing role in London she was going to be the breadwinner and um, and as I did that I went to uni to study youth work and theology um, pretty much as we did it Steph became really unwell uh, it started with like a run-of-the-mill uh, migraine that migraine lasted for six months uh, that turned into as a result of the perpetual pain chronic fatigue and she was out of work as she was bed bound and house bound for quite a long time wasn't it out of work for two and a half years and you know when you're like setting out on the journey of god and it's going to be great we just got married and i'm like it's just bed bound and house bound and we've now got no income source and it it shifted a lot we clung to jesus like you would not believe and i now look back and think kind of like david when he was a shepherd you taught things in those moments we saw financial provision that was breathtaking that has now taught us things even about leading the church where you're like it's gonna be all right because <laughs> it was all right then it'll be all right now but we um anyway long story short we we um came to the end of that chapter and um we we felt again often you come to these crossroads and we felt god nudging us to take another step i'd given up the fire service to be more involved in the vineyard and now we felt the lord saying i'm gonna call you out to call you back in and we're like hang on a minute i'm now giving up the thing that i found healing and freedom in you're asking me to give that up and so we resigned from those roles and i applied for jobs all over the country eventually yeah, i got one with a mission organization that was sending church plants all around the world little did we know again that it might be quite a remarkable thing um, and as I, the first day of that job, the guy who's leading the organization sat me down, first 15 minutes, said, I've got something to tell you. And I said, well, I've got something to tell you. And uh, anyway, he said, he's leaving the organization and I'm next in line to lead it. And it was like, whoa, 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 <laughs> what, what, have we, what have we just done here? Um, and I told him, actually, I'd just heard that morning that my dad had died and he'd been on a journey of having cancer and it had chewed him up and obviously for me personally with my upbringing that was it was quite a significant moment but we've often just found we've had these pivotal moments it's like we call them crossroads moments where it's like i could choose to be safe and comfortable mm -hmm. or i could choose to jump again into faith and risk and the fullness of what i think i'm hearing the whispers of the lord saying and we've 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 just continually gone through those moments haven't we yeah, and that, so that job had brought us to Nottingham. Yeah. So we were then part of Trent Vineyard. Um, and we were there for a number of years and serving on the, on the staff team there and fully committed to, to the leaders there and to the vision there. Um, and then just as we sort of think, okay, surely we've like made our, all our big leaps of faith, then God starts talking to us about church planting, um, which actually he'd been talking to us for about a decade hadn't he? Yeah. We'd been sort of jotting down words and pictures that people had had for us over over the years. Um, it started actually before we even got married, and um, and then there came a point where 
suddenly the prophetic increased. I think Paul said last night that in the space of one year, there was about 70 prophetic words, which is kind of embarrassing when you say. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Like some people probably do it on one or two, but, and it seems like maybe we we're really resistant or disobedient, but I th- on the contrary, we were so, so keen to be obedient, to only do what the Lord was, was asking of us and to, and to follow his lead, that he was just actually really kind to keep reaffirming to us again and again and again and again. Um, so, yeah, so then that obviously led to another massive leap of faith of, of saying yes to that, of then leaving our church family and our, our community that we'd built there, moving to a city that where we didn't know anybody. Um, thankfully, a number of faithful people came, came with us to help us start a church. Um, but, yeah, it's just... I mean, like you often say, you're only as good as your last leap of faith. Um, And I guess we've got to get comfortable with that, that life is going to be a whole series of leaps of faith, of stepping into the unknown um, and and, and following the Lord where where he leads. And, yeah, we just don't, don't want to get so comfortable that we stop hearing the whispers, hearing the nudges, and then yeah, not be bold enough to say, okay, we're in. So, I mean, what that means for our future, I don't know. Um, because I hear you're moving to Ireland. Don't tempt us. We talked about that a couple of times the last few days. We're to talk about um, I, I think there's been some real complications on the journey of all of that, though. I said Steph was really unwell. Um, both of our children... I don't know how this is even a thing because apparently genetically it's not a thing. But both of them have had meningitis and it, it got really serious. At both of them at 13 months. Yeah, I mean, work that out. Um, and they're four years apart, you know, it's not... Yeah. yeah, before COVID apparently was over here, I ended up in a really bad place and um, I actually said goodbye to Steph. It got so bad. My resting heart rate was 210 for three days. Um, I ended up having three months off work, couldn't really walk or talk I said a couple of words every day and I look back on it and I think I would use the language of a thought my mind had gone but obviously at the time my mind had gone so I wouldn't have that language you know people are like oh you rest and you must be just praying and worshiping and I'm like I'm really not in a in a good place here um so we've we've definitely found and faced some challenges but alongside that I I think is it Jesus said in John to the disciples, blessed are the eyes that have seen the things you see. Mm. We have seen the kingdom of God break in in the most profound, miraculous ways. And we have to fight to stay in the game mm. to see those things. We've got to fight. Like, yeah, there'll be some resistance. There'll be some challenges. Sometimes it's hard. We have to fight to stay in the game. And I remember just before that moment of, of getting really ill, we've done this kind of thing in the city called 422 where we've we, we've we've always just sought as i was saying last night to serve the last the last and the least and to give everything we've got to the poor and this thing we've done with this building you, you wouldn't do in the natural um it's been about a million pound in cash and a million pound in resource um to create this center that doesn't re- benefit the needs of the church but it does serve the city we kind of need a building of our own but it's like hey let's prioritize the city anyway um Middle of the night, I wake up, and I'm fully awake. You know, you're like, I'm not dreaming. I'm fully awake. And there is this being in the room that was in the room but didn't fit in the room. And it was just shards of light that seemed to go for eternity as I, I looked at them. And I would now use the language of maybe it was an angelic being. At the time, you're like, oh, what is going on here? Um, and anyway, I, I kind of had a verbal conversation where it was like, do you doubt me? And I'm like, I don't don't doubt mm. and in my head at this moment if any, if I was to doubt anything it was actually this thing we've done with 422 has been a real challenge it's cost us financially it's cost us time resource it's it's cost us personally just with the depth of yearning that you have to pour into these things and um, I didn't want to be like mute you know like Zachariah where you're like I doubt you so just in my head I was like if I doubt anything it's 4-2-2. Anyway, room goes back to normal. And Steph's always been like, why didn't you wake me up with this thing? But room goes back to normal, whatever that even means. And I look at my phone and it's 4.22 in the morning. You know, just sometimes you get these moments of God just gives you a glimpse of go again. 
Have faith again. Trust me again. Believe in me again. Repent of your unbelief again. Fully step into what the Lord has. And the, the journey that has now unfolded with that has, has been, at multiple points, miraculous provision. But I'd, I'd always want to cheer people on for, sometimes it's hard, but I think he, it says in Hebrews, re, renew the... Um, renew the grip of your hand, you know, strengthen the grip of your hand. Go again. Don't don't give in. That's, that's, it's just amazing to hear your guys' story. And I, and I think it's it's encouraging for us because the danger is that when we step out into whatever God has called us, and we'll touch on this in, in a bit more in, in a moment, that for many of us, we're not called into the church. We're called into the other kingdom activity. Um, but... The reality is we will experience resistance. We will experience difficulty. And we need to be resilient to stand firm. You read through the New Testament. The Apostle Paul especially talks a lot about standing firm in the faith. Uh, and actually, that's what you guys have done to say, you know what? For, at different stages, you could have very easily been like, actually, this is too costly. Uh, you know what? We need to prioritize the kids in this moment or we need to, we don't have any income. We've got to just do something else. Be like, no, we're going to stand firm in, in what the Lord has called us to. Uh, and Steph, you, you were sharing just before this when we were talking about it, just around the fact that, you know, for some of us in the room, we will be called into the church, and that's wonderful. And as the, the, the vineyard, we are church planting movement. We are about raising, releasing people into ministry. But also many of us will, will be called elsewhere. Uh, and, but all of us are called into kingdom work. And, and as we step into that, all of us will still experience some of that buffeting and some of that resistance. Do you just want to speak into that in the moment and maybe encourage people who are sensing something and they're like, maybe it's not church? Yeah, I think it's just really important to acknowledge that, that we, like Paul was saying last night, we have all been called. And I think sometimes there's some sort of confusion around even the, the word calling. I think it's somehow uh, along the way has become synonymous with church ministry. Um, and that needs disentangling because we are all called um, and what we're called to will look completely different. There'll be a whole array. You know, thank God we're not all called to the church because we need to be in the world too, you know? Um, and some people will be called to, to the healthcare service, to being s social workers, to, you know, just, I mean, a whole range of things, business people, we need to be in all the different environments so we can actually be the hands and feet of Jesus in the world. So in terms of calling, we all have a kingdom calling. And I think it's really important to differentiate between kingdom calling and like calling to ministry because that's just one, that's one calling of many callings. Um, I, yeah, I, for us, we... We never, we never imagined this for our lives. We didn't. We weren't like, oh, yes. That's, you know, I was born and thought I'm going to lead a church one day. That, absolutely not. Couldn't think of anything worse for quite, quite a long time. Um, no interest in leading a church. Um, looked actually really hard. Um, but ultimately, we've got to partner with what, God sees and what he wants for our lives and, and that's what he had marked us out for um, so I'm, it makes it sound really gloomy and I'm, you know, I'm doing something I don't like it, that's not the whole story I started off in a place where I was like that's not really what I'm imagining for my life and then you know, God starts to speak and he puts us in environments and in soil where we're kind of trained and nurtured in, you know, in preparation for what he's moving us into and Whilst leading a church is at times hugely costly, it's also an enormous privilege. And I wouldn't want to be anywhere else other than at the centre of his, his calling, his plan A for my life. Um, so yeah, it's just it's determining what, what, what is it that he's put on you specifically and then running headlong into that with him. And like, like Paul was saying, you know, there's going to be resistance for all of us wherever we're in agreement with what, what it is that God has marked us out for. Um, but the promise is, and Jesus himself said, in this life there will be trouble. So that's, that's a certainty. There will be trouble, there will be pain, there will be challenges. But take heart, I have overcome the world. We, the, he never promised that life would be easy, 
but he does promise to be with us. And that is everything. Um, so whatever God is calling you into, whether you kind of like the shape of it or the look of it or not particularly, just trust him because honestly, he has the best ideas. And ultimately, I mean, he, he's the one who's crafted us, formed us. We are, it says in Ephesians, we are his masterpiece. So if he knows us, if he's created us, then really he, you'd think, would be the best one to determine how we're going to be used and, and how we're going to live out our kingdom, kingdom calling. So, so I just say, cling to him. Look to him, trust him, ask him, Lord, what is it you determined for my life? What is, the, what is the race that you've marked out for me? And then help me run it. And help me run it with perseverance. Yeah, and we've, we've always said that the, the uh, meeting place is the training place for the marketplace. You know, come to the church, give it everything you've got to be fully trained up and equipped to then go and live it out. And I remember... Um, the vineyard was revolutionary for me with that. I was like, well, this thing isn't just for in here. This thing's for out there. So I'd go back into the fire service, which honestly was the most unbelievably dark environment to work. It was so sexualized and complicated, some of the people I used to work with. And, and so I, I needed to find ways to swing stuff from that to the kingdom. And um, I went on a mission trip to Albania with some guys in the church and I got there and they didn't have anything like fire station, fire engine stuff. So I went back to the fire station. I worked out, I was like, guys, I think we could do something here. And we ended up taking two fire engines out and a load of equipment and driving them around Italy was like one of the best days of my life. But, <laughs> um, but honestly, you, it's like, how can I change my workplace? How can I be salt and light? How can I be the light on the stand? And how can I actually intentionally realize I'm called to, to make a difference? And so I remember the, the last day I worked there, there was this dear lady, um, Caribbean lady. She was in her 80s who was the cleaner. And she burst into tears. And I'm like, why, why are you crying? She's like, because you're leaving. And I was like, why, why are you crying about that? Um, and I, she said, because you're one of the only people who talks to me. And you know, you're like, you don't realize the impact you make on someone's life. You've got to sow seeds and sow seeds and sow seeds, knowing that actually it's God that causes them to grow. But we get to make a difference in people's lives. We get to be salt and light. We get to extend the kingdom in whatever environment he's placed us. But we've got to do that. And we've got to do it intentionally. Also, just to say, you being in the fire service, um, you sort of started off, didn't you, as, um, I think you were the, the, the youngest fireman in the country at the time or something, weren't you? And um, anyway, so you'd, you'd gone in as a Christian and probably the most ridiculed fireman there could ever be. Um, and by the time you left, he, he was hugely respected because he had said, I'm a Christian and this is what it means to be a Christian and then they'd lived it out and had, you know, of, of course not perfect. I'm sure there'll have been moments where you might have wished you'd done more or said more or whatever, but they 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 understood that this is what it looks like to to be a follower of Jesus. Um, and yeah, by the end, they they hugely respected you, didn't they? And I mean, you also made some choices over the years of being in the fire service. Like one one example was there's a massive dr drinking culture among uh, among the the fire fire people, um, and as is. In, there is in the world and Paul made a decision probably fairly early on maybe the first within the first couple of years of being a fireman that he was just going to be completely teetotal um, because he didn't he was just like I'm gonna I just want to send quite a clear message that actually I don't need alcohol to well I meant you want to just yeah I, when you're in a culture that goes one way even if you just have a couple of beers when you're out think you're drunk and so I think you've got to swing the other way. And I just, yeah, gave it up. And um, I, I think the thing, again, I, I, I look back, and I'm like, the vineyard taught me something there. I just went into that work environment and said, I'm just going to serve. I'm going to give it everything I've got. When everyone's been lazy, I'm going to be the one who's not going to be lazy. I'm going to tidy up the kitchen. I'm going to clean the floors. I'm going to put the effort in. Over a number of years and quite a bit of living that way, people start to go, there's something about you that is different, what is it? Yeah. 
And I think we've got to be the message before we can often communicate the message. But you had to put the hard work in, didn't you? Because, you know, in those first few years where he was hugely ridiculed and, like, the youngest one on the station and um, he, he paused at the... Uh, um, one of the Essex fire stations that's one of the biggest um, so loads of loads of firefighters there um, and Paul was the youngest he, he, it would have been so easy within those first couple of years to just bow to the culture there and just sort of fit in but we have choices where we, we can resolve to be different and it, it may it may well be very very hard but and Ian you may not get the outcome that Paul eventually did after years and years and years of doing it of actually being respected for his faith but regardless of the outcome it's what we're called to it, we're called to be different we're called to be noticeably different um, and to be in the world but not of the world yeah, it's good and it's, it's the Lord will honour our integrity and he will form us as we do that and some of you might have come across the, the phrase that has been said of uh, especially the young 20s of quiet quitting in the workplace, where especially now so much remote work post-COVID, uh, of is some of us in our generation maybe just kind of pulling back a bit and going, I'm just going to do the, the least amount possible to get through. Uh, and as you're sharing, I was just like, well, what would it look like actually rather than being quiet quitters, we were quiet servers. And we just said, you know, we'll turn up and we'll serve. And this, you know, like you said, it, it took you years. And that's important. It might take years of just faithfully following Jesus and being sought in light until you start to see the fruit, but it will be worth it. Um, I, as we come into land, I think I just want to say a couple of things. One thing is some of you in the room, and we've talked a little bit about leadership this morning. We've talked about the pathway earlier. Some of you are... Uh, are sensing a call from the Lord. And for some of you, you really clearly know what that is. And others of you, you're like, I don't know, but there's just something stirring in me. I think there's something more. And for some of you, you're like, please, Lord, no. <laughs> please, no. I'm not a leader. I don't want to do that. That's the last thing I'd ever want to do. Uh, but you just know that you know that the Lord is just beginning to stir something. Uh, and if that's you, then I would really, really encourage you at some point this weekend, grab someone, ask them to pray for you, ask, ask for the Lord to fill you and speak to you and come and have a chat, especially with the pathway, guys. The, the pathway isn't the be all and end all, but it is an amazing resource that's there for you to help explore what God might be calling you to. Uh, and that could be leadership in any sphere. We've talked about that. But I also just want to put into the room, we've mentioned church planting. The, the vineyard is a movement that believes in planting churches and sending people uh, to go and start new communities of God. And the, the truth is, we need us in the cause generation to consider it, to go for it, if we still want to have healthy, thriving churches in the next 20, 30, 40 years. And so I passionately believe that there'll be people in this room and there'll be people through as we do cause Island who God will stir to plant churches. Uh, and if that is you, again, you might be right at the start of your journey. You might be like, I've never even led a small group. How could I ever lead a church? I don't know if I could ever preach the Bible. How could I lead a church? But again, you maybe are just feeling a stirring. Would love to invite you to come and chat to us, especially come and chat to Paul and Steph. Uh, not only do they lead Manchester Vineyard, not only do they lead Cause to Live For, they are also part of the Multiply. You guys do a lot of stuff. They're also part of the Multiply uh, team, which is Vineyards, Multiplication, and Church Planting and Church Succession. And they would love to chat to you and just answer any questions you might have. Uh, and then do you want to just plug... I was just, I, can I say two things about that? First is, I, I've often found it fascinating about leadership because I've never sought to be a leader. I never actually see myself as a leader. I don't see in the Bible that much that it talks about leadership. I think it talks about followership. And so I think our first and foremost thing is following Jesus. And from that, that leaks because that brings influence and that influence that you want to leak is a kingdom thing. So I think sometimes I'm like, I, I even now I'm like, am I a leader? <laughs> like, I, I don't know whether I always like leading, but I do love following Jesus. And I do love following those that lead me. And I do love finding people who love Jesus to teach me more about him. And I think from that, you then create environments naturally as an overflow of 
sharing and showing Jesus, which is influence and ultimately leadership is influence, isn't it? And the thing that I would say just about the, the multiply thing that you were saying is we we never planned to plant a church, but we did from the very early days turn up in a church and said, I want to be in. And to be in, that's going to mean giving my time and giving my money and giving everything I've got to Christ his church's cause. But we're in, we're in a church planting movement. What does that mean? To us at the time, that didn't mean planting churches. That meant being faithful with the thing that was ahead of us, following the leader that was ahead of us, getting in a small group and helping them plant small groups, and then one day leading small groups that would plant small groups. But whatever we're doing, we want to be multiplying it. We want to be growing it, not because we think that's a good idea, but because that's the kingdom principle. That's what we see and that's what we read. And so I think... I would say to anyone, don't, don't worry about the thing you will do. What, what can you be doing now? Mm -hmm. Follow the leader in front of you. Get involved in the thing that is happening and see it grow, see it multiply. Because those that are given much, much is expected. But it starts with a small thing. It starts with just being faithful with the thing that's in your hands. So, mm -hmm. I'd, I, yeah, absolutely. The, the summit that's coming up in June is a great environment to be for those. But I often think the local church is the primary place where we say I'm I'm in, and I'm, I'm going to live it out fully. That's good. There is space for you. Play your part.